All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought, and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other, I can promise you that. You might laugh, you might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. This week's episode is going to be a sweet one. This week's guest is a leading, and again, I had to practice this word like 18 times, neuroendocrinologist, there we go, who's bringing the bitter truth about sugar and food to the forefront and how it relates to obesity and the way that we live. He has benefited the lives of countless children. Uh, He has had over, I think it's like hundreds and 50 uh, peer-reviewed articles or and 65 review articles. Um, not only is he a renowned scientist, you can also say he is part YouTube star uh, with his videos combining to over 50 million views, which is a lot. Uh, and when sugar isn't consuming his time, he can be seen at the local theater, cooking, traveling with his wife and daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the maestro of metabolism and the Sherpa of combating sugar, Dr. Robert Lustig. Robert, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Jake. I have to say that is the, um, uh, shall we say, um, uh, most uh, interesting introduction I think I've ever had. And I didn't know anybody had ever (laughs) totaled up all the YouTube views. Um, So thank you for doing that. Yeah, you go. I gotcha. We take care of it. Tyler, shout out to Tyler for the research and the prep. Um, So look, this is going to be a fun conversation. I think it's going to be, I, I'm really interested in, you know, I think we'll, we'll skip to the, the, the future sooner than we normally do, just because of, you know, some of the work that you're doing. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is just, just a topic that's very top of mind for me. But, you know, like in, in all the episodes, we like to tell the story of, you know, how someone gets into neuroendocrinology, right? Look at that. Now, see, now I've got it down. Now I've got it like some, that, somewhat that down, I perfect. should say. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we'll go back in time. So let's talk about it. So you were, you're born in Brooklyn and we were talking about this a little yeah. bit before. Um, and this is, you know, for people putting it out there, this is, you know, 60s, 70s Brooklyn, not, you know, I lived there in the 2000s, you know, Park Slope, 2010s Park Slope right, Brooklyn. Right. This is like the original Brooklyn. So what are some, you know, big memories you have of growing up and, um, you know, some of like the early, early moments well, that you remember? Uh, so I was born in 1957 and, um, I lived in Brooklyn until 1973 when I went off to college. Um, I suppose uh, one of my biggest memories was watching the Verrazano Bridge get built back in 1963, 64. You know, that was like, oh, okay, you can do do that. Uh, You know, uh, I suppose that, I don't know if it had any specific role in my uh, development, but, you know, it was certainly uh, uh, interesting to say the least. I bet. Um, I bet. What did your parents uh, my do? My father was an accountant, and my mother had several jobs. She was a New York City school secretary by day, and she was the agent for my grandparents' real estate uh, uh, rentals in uh, Manhattan uh, by evening. So, you know, I, I basically, you know, I grew up as a latchkey kid most of the time. You know, I had to let myself in at, you know, at three o'clock and, you know, basically be self-disciplined enough to, you know, do my homework and what have you. So, um, you know, I was on my own for a while, you know, for, for an early time. Yeah. And what are some, again, from like your parents working, are there any kind of memories that stand out or any kind of things as you look back that, you know, help to shape you or your work well, ethic? I was uh, a little too young and a little too smart for my own good. Um, I, you know, if you did the math on that, I was born in 57, went to college in 73. So I was 16 when I went to MIT and it's because I was, you know, kind of, um, advanced from a academic standpoint, but not from a social standpoint. And, uh, my parents sent me to yeshiva, you know, Jewish day school, uh, initially, and they start kindergarten at age four instead of age five. And the question was, all right, when I went to regular public school, were they going to leave me back for my age or were they going to advance me because of my grade? And they ended up, you know, advancing me, which was 
good from an academic standpoint, but, you know, I used to get picked on. I was smaller than the other kids, and I was smarter than the other kids, and I wasn't very good at <coughs> hiding it. Hiding that. <laughs> I got bullied a lot. And uh, the other thing that I remember very clearly, very vividly, it's like, you know, front and center in my brain almost on a daily basis. I'm a lefty. And it was second grade, and I had a witch of a teacher named Mrs. Weiser. And Mrs. Weiser, one of our, you know, one of the tasks of the class was to cut out the paper flowers with those, you know, scissors that, you know, basically, you know, had right. blunt ended and, you know, basically had no, no, uh, <laughs> right. you know, no, no blade to start with. And try to do that when you're a lefty and younger than everybody else. And she screamed at me and told me that I would never amount to anything in my life. And it was right at that moment that I said, well, clearly I can't use my hands, so I'm going to use my brain. And I think that was probably wow. one of my most formative moments. Wow. Wow. All for not cutting a piece of yeah. paper. Uh, Indeed correctly yeah it's it's interesting how those things stay with us and at times we pull from them at times you know we pull from those those moments um and you know we kind of find a way to use them to our advantage versus you know let it let it tear us down or keep us well, back I, I decided, um, I and so yes you go to mit <laughs> yeah exactly and 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 again so you go to mit again 16 um how did you know i mean again like you, you know get uh, undergrad life science and then obviously you go on to uh, you know, get your medical degree too. Like, you know, was that a thing? Did you know, like, hey, this is a path, like, you well, know, I want to be in medicine? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, when I was a kid, I actually wanted to be an astronomer. And I actually took courses at the Hayden Planetarium on Saturday mornings. I used to ride the train myself from Brooklyn into oh, Manhattan, cool. going up to, you know, uh, uh, Museum of Natural History and the Hayden Planetarium. And uh, I knew how to run the Zeiss projector myself when I was 10 years old. You know, it was pretty cool back then, you know. There weren't, there weren't a lot of cool. rules back then. Um, <laughs> You're a 10 year old riding the subway. Exactly. Yeah, like that. You know, that was probably before the subway now. changed. You know, now it's changed back again. Thank God. You know, it's, uh, you can actually ride the subway. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, at the time, that was something that, you know, you know kids did. And um, I, uh, like I said, I was pretty much on my own. And New York was my oyster, as it were. And um, I remember. Uh, of, uh, you know, thinking I was going to be an astronomer. And my mother and father sat me down and said, Bobby, you can be anything you want to be. And my grandmother in the background said, but a doctor makes so much money. <laughs> I don't know if that had any, I don't know uh, if that had any, uh, uh, sway. On yeah. It like stuck though. back there for a little bit. So anyway, uh, in, in, uh, in seventh grade, I did a term paper on the hypothalamus because the uh, 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 first hypothalamic releasing factor had been discovered by Guillemin and Shally in uh, 1967, work at the Salk Institute and also Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and it was just really interesting to me that the brain controlled all of these functions inside the body, you know, controlled metabolism. And this was the first proof of that because they isolated this. And so I did a term paper on the hypothalamus and somewhere along the way, I decided I was going to be a hypothalamus doctor. And sure enough, I am. Yeah. Okay. And you said, wait, that was seventh, seventh grade? grade? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. A term paper on the hypothalamus in seventh grade. And so then you decide, right? And then that you kind of go down that path. Right. So um, and went to it, MIT, you know, yeah. studied applied biology, you know, pre-med, whatever, you know. Um, was very interested in nutrition because at that point in time, you know, we were really discovering, you know, the diseases that micronutrients and vitamins were able to treat. And I thought that that was what I was going to go into. Um, then I went to medical school and they beat it out of me and said, no, we don't care about any of that. You know, it's all calories. It's all, you know, eat less, exercise more. It's all, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, medicines, prescriptions and procedures. If that's what you learn in medical right. school. That's your, that's, that's the job. That's, the, that's know. right. And, you know, Hey, I was paying a tuition and, you know, 
Um, these were the gurus, you know, they clearly made it, and this is what they said you had to do. And so, you know, I bought it for 20 years. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, and I know, obviously, like, in between that time, though, you got, you know, you started to kind of also specialize again in working with, you know, children as right. well, too. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of things in between. Sure. Obviously, you're, you know, kind of moving to San Francisco, you worked, you know, a lot of different work before, but how did you start to kind of re-gravitate toward that, you know, to St. Jude's, and then, you know, obviously, right. to, you know, what you're doing now? Um, how did you start to kind of gravitate toward that part right. of you know, the profession, so, you know, it's a circuitous route, you know, I mean, it's never a straight line. Uh, what, uh, you know, I'm a hypothalamus doctor. I take care of kids with damaged hypothalami and, you know, there's no, uh, greater, richer experience than to take care of kids with brain tumors, um, you know, who have damage to their brains because of the tumor or the, uh, surgery or the radiation or the chemotherapy. And so I uh, uh, took a job in, in 1995, sorry, um, at the University of Tennessee, Memphis, and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, a pediatric cancer hospital. And when I got there, there was a stable, a cadre of 40, give or take, children who had survived their brain tumors only to become massively obese enormous, hmm. 350, 400 pounds. Now these were normal kids before the tumor, but as soon as the tumor was treated, as soon as the surgery or as soon as the radiation, these kids started eating like there was no tomorrow. Now this form of obesity had actually been known since 1901. Uh, Freelich and Babinski, you know, two of the giants in the field of neurology, you know, both categorized this, this hyperphagia, massive obesity due to hypothalamic damage. So it's called hypothalamic obesity. And I, <clears throat> you know, basically walked into, you know, this, uh, you know, S show uh, of, you know, of what do you do for these kids? And, or, and yeah. you know, it had been shown, you know, 25 years earlier by George Bray, one of the, you know, fathers of uh, obesity research in America. He took eight of these kids at UCLA Harbor and he admitted them to their clinical research center there and he locked them up and he threw away the key. And for a month he fed them 500 calories a day. And he knew they weren't sneaking because, you know, they controlled the diet. So what do you think happened to their weight on 500 calories a day? I mean, you'd think you it would, would think go it down. Would go down. It went up. Now, how can wow. it go up when they're eating 500 calories a day? I mean, were they metabolizing air? Well, it turns right. out these kids would rather store it than burn it. So when your hypothalamus is damaged, okay, your brain thinks you're starving. When your brain thinks you're starving, it tells your body, don't burn because that's only going to make you even more starving it tells you to conserve and it tells you to eat more. Now I knew about this, you know, form of obesity. And then in 1994, uh, modern medicine, um, Rudy Leibel and, and uh, Jeff Friedman at Rockefeller university a place I worked. And so I knew these guys and I knew what they were working on. And they finally were able to clone this hormone out of fat cells called leptin. Now, leptin, it has finally made the medical textbooks. It took a while. But leptin is a hormone that is made by a fat cell, goes to your brain via the bloodstream, and tells your brain, you know what? I have enough energy on board. I don't need to eat everything in sight. And I can engage in expensive metabolic processes because I have reserve. I can engage in normal exercise. I can engage in puberty. I can engage in pregnancy because I'm not starving. I'm not threatened. And that all comes, all from, comes that from that hormone. hormone. It's basically the servo mechanism like you have in your house, the, your, your thermostat. Okay. It keeps you at a stable level. You know, when it's cold outside, you ha it kicks in. Okay. When it's hot outside, it turns off. Okay. And so leptin is supposed to tell your brain what your body's fat stores are so that you can 
you know, conduct metabolic processes effectively. Now, it was very clear that these kids, these 40 kids of mine, you know, their leptin wasn't working. Because if it were working, they wouldn't be obese. Now, I knew I couldn't fix a brain. I'm not a neurosurgeon, and, you know, even neurosurgeons can't fix the hypothalamus. So the question was, all right, what can I do for them? Is there anything I can do for them? And the end, so I, I, I knew about the literature about damaging the hypothalamus, because after all, I'm a hypothalamus doctor. And I went to the literature, and indeed, you could re, um, reverse this process in rats by cutting the connection between the brain and the pancreas called the vagus nerve. And what the vagus nerve did was it was overactive in these lesioned animals. And it was, and the pancreas was basically pouring out tons and tons of the hormone insulin. Insulin. Now, insulin is the diabetes right. hormone. Everybody knows you got to, you know, diabetics have to take shots of insulin, okay, to lower their blood glucose. That's true. But, okay, the blood glucose gets lowered. Where did the blood glucose go? People don't know. Turns out it went to the fat for storage. Right. Insulin is the energy storage hormone. And so these kids, because they couldn't see their leptin, they were putting out insulin like crazy specifically right. to drive more energy into fat to create more leptin, which they did, except their brain still couldn't see it because it's still broken. And so this is the vicious cycle of consumption, of insulin, of leptin resistance, and further consumption. So I had to figure out what to do for them. So I said, well, I can't cut the vagus nerve because I'm not a surgeon. But if the vagus nerve is telling the pancreas to make more insulin, maybe I can knock the insulin down. And there was a drug that we had available to us called octreotide, which normally is used to suppress growth hormone, but it also suppresses insulin. And so I decided to repurpose it for this group of patients. And we did it as a you know, pilot study, and then it worked. And then we did it as a double-blind placebo control trial, and it worked again. And so I published on this, and I said, hmm, this is a way to treat this disease. Okay. But what does that have to do with the rest of obesity? And the answer is, Everything. And it turns out because everyone is not seeing their leptin. Right. Functional leptin resistance, not anatomic, not because of brain damage, but because of a dysfunction in brain signaling, but ultimately causes the same thing. So I said, all right, what if we got insulin down in normal people? And sure enough, that worked too. Now, as it turns out, there are different reasons for insulin to be high, and you have to figure out which is the reason. Sure. And when you direct the therapy to the pathology, guess what? It works. So I've been all about insulin ever since. So then the question that led me to where we are today and me talking to you is, all right, these people don't have a brain tumor, but they still can't see their leptin. And it's because of their insulin that they can't see their leptin. Why is their insulin so high? And that's what led me to sugar. Because it turns well, out let's get sugar, into it. which is two molecules, glucose and fructose, turns out that fructose molecule turns into fat in the liver. And when the uh, liver turns that fructose into fat, it precipitates in the liver and gives you something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which makes you insulin resistant, which raises your insulin levels, which then blocks your leptin, which then makes your brain think you're starving, which makes you then eat more and exercise less. And so there's the vicious cycle all over again, not from brain damage, but from brain dysfunction, from high insulin, from fatty liver, from sugar. And so... I said, all right, let's take the sugar out of people's diets. And when did you start to get on that? Like, when was it for you? You kind of, I guess, like realized that sugar has these like just, you know, I'd call it like domino effect. Right. right. And 
you know, over the course of, you know, your life and over the course of, again, impacting different right. parts of it? So um, it was 2006. Okay. I, uh, I was asked to give a talk at the NIH. It was their 100th anniversary of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which is the toxicology branch. And they were having a you know, two-day-long symposium, a celebration of you know, 100 years of public health. And on the first day, they were talking about their successes, so like <clears throat> lead poisoning and pollution and asthma, all good. And in, on the second day, it was about challenges. And the morning was obesity and metabolic syndrome, and the afternoon was going to be ADD and autism. So I was part of the obesity uh, section, and they said, you know, we would like you to give a talk on what you think is the biggest driver of obesity and metabolic syndrome today. And I said, okay. And I thought to myself, well, you know, they want me to talk about some chemical in the water or in the environment, like, you know, right. estrogens in the environment or bisphenol A or flame retardants or phthalates or plasticizers or, you know, um, uh, 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 Teflon or something like that, you know, all of which are, you know, uh, important and all of which do drive weight gain. Uh, they are environmental obesogens. And that's all true. Right. And we just wrote uh, three review articles in biochemical pharmacology on this. So it's not like that's nothing. It's true. But I said, you know, that ain't it. That ain't it. Something else is going on. I said, all right, let me take this a different way. Let me think of this a different way. I'm a pediatrician. What are the diseases that children now get today that they never got before? Children are the canaries in the coal mine. They are always more right. vulnerable to everything than everybody else because they are children. Children are not just little adults. Okay, They are more susceptible. So what are those diseases? I said, well, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. These were diseases we had never seen before in children. They were unknown right, right. in children. And now everybody's got it. You know, type 2 diabetes, one-third of all new diabetes diagnoses in, the America, in America in children is type 2. It was always type 1. Now it's type 2. And fatty liver disease, you know, 25% of children now have fatty liver. Not 25% not of obese kids, 25% of all kids. Wow. Okay, where'd that come from? So I said, all right, wait a second. These diseases, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, they were the diseases of aging, but kids are not old. And also, they were the diseases of alcohol. But kids don't drink alcohol. So I said, all right, is there something that's mimicking alcohol in the body? Is there something that's acting like alcohol? So I opened up my biochemistry textbook, uh, from 1974, you know, from 30 years earlier, okay? And I turned to the alcohol page, and there it was right next door on the next page, fructose. Fructose really? is metabolized like alcohol. And it makes sense that that would be the case because, after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. You do it, you know, Napa yep. Sonoma every day. You know, the big difference between... Fructose and alcohol is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism called glycolysis. For fructose, we do our own first step. But after that, the mitochondria in our cells, the little energy-burning factories in our cells, they don't care where it came from. And so alcohol caused these diseases. Guess what? Fructose causes these diseases. And God knows kids consume a whole lot of fructose. And it was put there on purpose. Buy the food industry. Right. So I went to this NIH meeting and I <clears throat> presented a half hour, you know, talk on what I thought was the biggest problem in obesity and metabolic syndrome today. And I said, I think it's this. And then, uh, the, you know, they, you know, applauded and then we had the bathroom break and I was standing at the podium talking to people and, you know, that no one was coming back to start the next session. 
and I had to use the bathroom. So I went out to the lobby, and I got tackled in the lobby by all these people milling around, screaming at me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He's right. He's right. And these are the toxicologists. I mean, you know, like, you know. Right. Like, really? <laughs> and they were, you're right. Sugar's a toxin. You have to tell everybody about this. And I've been telling everybody about it since. <laughs> and then, you know, as you, as you kind of have, again, we're talking almost, you know, it's called seven, 16, 17 years later, right? And you think about, you know, and you've written books on it and you've written multiple books on it and talked about, you know, this many, many, many times. You know, how have you seen, I guess, like maybe two-part question, the evolution of, I guess, like the consciousness of this? you know, and, and this topic and, and kind of where we're at today versus where we've come from. And then also kind of the second part is what are, you know, when you're talking to people and they say, I get it, it's so hard, et cetera. Right. You know, like, how do you talk to people about changing right. habits? And, you know, I, I feel like people are becoming more and more and more food right. conscious. You know, I feel, it feels like it right. Every, every year, but you know, how have you seen the evolution? And then, you know, how do you kind of practically talk to right. people? Um, you know, about this, you know, shift in, in, in why it's so important? Very good question, Jake. And um, it, as you said, it's a two-part question, and it's two different phenomena. One is, uh, you know, shall we say, modifying a belief system. And the other one is engaging in compliance, you know, and, and dealing with non-compliance. So those are two different things. How do you change a belief system? That's hard. Okay, because it's a belief system. It's not necessarily based on any facts, but it's a belief system. Mm -hmm. You believe it. Okay, like religion is a belief system. Okay, how many pe how many people change religions? Yeah, not I mean, often. They, a few, but not very many. Okay, you know, I mean, is there any proof of any of it? No, but you know, people are who they are, and this is what they believe. So where does that come from? It comes from way back. Well, ultimately, it comes back from how you're educated. And we've been educated for the last 50 years in America that a calorie is a calorie. That is right. the belief system. There is no proof of that statement. None. There's an equation, but that's not proof. The equation dates back to 1916, where Il Wilbur Atwater... Okay, blew up in a bomb calorimeter some fat and some protein and some carbohydrate. And the fat blew up and he got nine calories per gram. And the protein blew up and it was four calories per gram. And the carbohydrate blew up and it was four calories per gram. So he said protein and carbohydrate were the same and fat was more energy dense and therefore fat must be the source of obesity. Any proof to that? No. Interesting. But that's what, and, but you know, it sounded good. It sounded actually like common sense. And the food industry loved it. They glommed on to that. All right. And the reason they glommed on to that was because they had a whole series of low fat foods to sell us. Okay, and so they actually like doubled their revenue, right? And it's not like they threw the fat away. They took the fat and turned it into cheese. And they sold that. Right. So they actually took the milk, okay, and got two products out of it instead of one and sold both at high dollar. So, you know, they, they made out like bandits, the, uh, the food industry. So they basically promulgated this notion that a calorie is a calorie, but there's no data to support it. And I can prove categorically numerous ways, every which way from Sunday, that a calorie is not a calorie. That, you know, uh, the quality of the food ultimately determines the quantity of the food at many different levels. At the level of the microbiome, at the level of the cell, at the level of the hypothalamus, okay? Ultimately, that's why I had to write my first book, Fat Chance, which basically definitively demonstrates that a calorie is not a calorie. Okay? You are not what you eat. You are what you do with what you eat. You are what you metabolize. Now, 
That did not sit well with a lot of people because they had a belief system. And in particular, it didn't sit well with the dietitians because after all, for the last hundred years, they've been counting calories. That's right. 2000, right? And we've got this set for the average American, 2000. Total BS, complete, utter garbage. My job, my unwritten job is to kill the calorie as a unit of measure. It was crap when it started and it's bigger crap now. Okay. And it's actually inhibiting progress. Okay. So I am dedicated to killing the calorie. And if I have to kill a few dietitians along the way, so be it. <laughs> so as you're talking about this now, let's go to the, the second part, you know, as you think about how people are making changes, right? So again, if people have this very, it's, again, it's simple, right? We, we like simple things right. to measure, right? And, and so for those people, again, who are trying to figure right. this out, you know, how, how do you, you know, suggest or like, and again, obviously, you know, you've talked about this in like the, the book, the next book, Hacking of the American Mind, which I think, you know, obviously talks about some of these things, but, you know, h- how do people go about then monitoring or being more conscious and aware when calories is so simple? It's well, so it's, it's, it's simple, but there, it doesn't work. Know? And so people are, people yeah, are responding exactly. to the fact that it doesn't work. And they're looking, you, know, you know, one of the reasons that I've been successful is because people were ready to hear a different message. You know, when you've been basically, you know, hammering the same message, you know, over and over again, you know, that's Einstein's theory of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting right. a different result. You know, well, we've been doing the same thing over and over again for the last 50 years, and we ain't got no different result. We only got things worse. Nah, it's going, going the wrong way. Okay, so people are starting to look for new answers. And I, you know, proposed a new hypothesis. It wasn't just me, by the way. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm one of many. This was actually proposed by John Yudkin, a British physiologist, nutrition back in the 1960s and 70s. And, you know, he got thrown under the bus, you know, by the, the, the fat is bad people, you know, the Ansel Keys contingent and back in the late 1970s. And he lost his uh, 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 office and, you know, basically relegated to, you know, the dustbin of history. The University of London took away his lab and everything it was, you know. It was a disaster. And he died in ignominy. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, he was a prophet. And, you know, he got buried. And I'm very happy to have helped resurrect his uh, reputation and his image uh, because he was right. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, there's, there's dark forces out there that want to keep things the same because there's a lot of money to be made. This is a one6 trillion dollar industry processed food so you know a lot riding on it remember you remember how bad tobacco was at its heyday at its worst at its highest tobacco was a 56 billion dollar a year industry 56 billion 1.6 trillion okay all right yeah. there's a lot riding on this and the food industry is not going to go quietly so you know, for you, what's the, yeah, what's the future of food, right? We were talking about that a little bit. So as you think about this right. going forward, um, you know, what do you, again, cause I, I tell you like kind of the trends that I'm seeing is that, you know, again, you're seeing a lot of, you know, keto, you're seeing right. a lot of other, you know, bullet coffee, like these other trends that are meant to, you know, I mean, they cut out, a lot of them cut out sugar um, as a part of that. But, you know, what are the, what, what do you see as the future of foods? And maybe what are also some, you know, I, you know, I'd asked before about kind of ways of, of managing or, or thinking about, you know, your intake of various types right. of food with sugar being a, a main culprit. But where do, where do you see right. the ball so, going? There are three things. There's vegan, plant-based, and all the reasons why people are doing that. And I'm not against it. I'm not, I'm not for it either. I'm, you know, I'm very agnostic about this. All right. Then there's keto and all the people who adhere to that. And again, I'm not against it. Used it in my own clinic for the right patient. Um, but I'm also not for it. All right. What I'm really for is a, high, a low sugar, high fiber diet. That's called real food. 
Okay. And vegan food can be real food and <laughs> keto food can be real food or they cannot, you know, they can be processed food. All right. And then there is food processing itself, the processed food industry, the CPG industry. Okay. And the attempts to try to remake the processed food industry. So those are the, those are the three things you have the people yelling plant-based, you have the people yelling metabolic health, Oh, by the way, oh, wait, I'm for metabolic health. That's what I'm for. Okay. And then there's the people who say we can't feed people real food because we will have 10 billion people on the planet by the year 2050. And there's not enough real food to go around. We need processed food. So these are the three uh, stakeholder groups that are basically duking it out at the moment. And how do you deal with that? How does one make head or tail of this? Which macronutrients are we really talking about? Okay, do we want to go full on plant-based? Does that make sense? Well, there are a lot of things wrong with plant-based. Okay, one has to do with the oxidative stress of the soy hemoglobin, uh, you know, that they don't talk about. Another one has to do with the fact that Pretty much all plant-based food is tryptophan and methionine deficient. So you're actually generating selective amino acid deficiency, all right? So, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. And then, of course, the fact that... What, what does that well, mean for the lay person, right? I think tryptophan everyone knows because of Thanksgiving. Your body is made up of proteins, um, and your proteins are made up of amino acids. And there are 20 amino acids that make up your proteins in your body. 20 amino acids. Only nine of those are essential. That is, you have to eat them. You can't make them. The other 11 you can make. But those nine, you got to eat. And one of those is called tryptophan. And tryptophan is the rarest amino acid in our diet. And you get it from eggs, chicken, fish. Not exactly vegan. So a vegan diet is tryptophan deficient. Okay, another one's methionine. Methionine provides um, uh, sulfhydryl groups for uh, glutathione, which is the main antioxidant in your liver. So if you don't make, if you don't consume, sorry, enough tryptophan methionine, you're going to have metabolic syndrome by itself because you're not actually nutritionally replete. Now, on the keto side, keto's got lots of all those amino acids, okay? And it can be a good diet, and I'm not saying it can't. The problem with keto is staying on it. Because as right. soon as your insulin spikes, you're not keto anymore, okay? Your liver will shut down ketogenesis on a friggin' dime. So you got to keep your insulin levels super low in order to stay keto, right? So you know, all these keto cookies out there, are you frigging kidding me? <laughs> really? Those aren't, those are, that, that, doesn't no. work, that doesn't keep you in ketosis? <laughs> all right. And, Damn you it. Know, and there are all these people consuming exogenous, you know, like, you know, what uh, Oz was p peddling, rosemary ketone or whatever, raspberry ketone, sorry. Um, you know, I mean, this is junk. This is stupid. This is idiotic because the goal is to get the insulin down that, and those ketones are not going to do that. All right. So the bottom line is people can do vegan wrong and they can do keto wrong. All right. In fact, keto and vegan really, when it comes right down to it, are remarkably similar. Because the goal of both is to keep insulin down. And that's what I'm for, is keeping insulin down. Well, there's a really easy way to keep insulin down. Get rid of the sugar and make sure there's enough fiber in your diet. And that's called real food. So that's what I'm for. I'm for real food. And every diet around the world that works, and you can pick your diet, vegan, keto, uh, paleo, uh, um, Carnivore, uh, 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 Mediterranean, uh, 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 traditional Japanese, I don't care. Okay? Pick your diet. Okay? They're all real food. 
They none of them have processed food in them. Right. Processed food is the enemy because processed food is high sugar, low fiber. And it doesn't matter if it's vegan processed or keto processed. Ultimately, it's not the answer. So real food's the answer. But now we've got that third stakeholder group who is saying, and appropriately so, but we can't feed everybody process, uh, uh, real food because there's not enough land and right. it's too expensive and blah, blah, blah. And that's true today. Are there ways around it? And the answer is yes, there are. But it requires really rethinking and remodeling the food system and the food system model and the food business model. Because right now, the food, you know, uh, companies are basically paid to do the wrong thing. They are paid to make food that kills us. They are made. They are paid to make food that makes pharma big bucks, while basically. You know, insurance is, you know, in dire straits. Medicare will be broke by the year 2029. Social Security will be broke by the year 2034. And, you know, uh, health is going to hell in a handbasket across the board as diabetes and d Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease and cancer just continue to increase their inexorable rise because of processed food, because of these problems. So we have to incentivize the food industry to make money doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. But they've been doing the wrong thing for 50 years because we incentivize them to do it. And I can sum up the incentive in one word. Subsidies. Corn, wheat, soy, sugar. All things that are killing us. All the things that are actually the bad things in our food. So what are we going to do about that? So there are ways to manage that. I think we should get rid of all food subsidies, okay, because they distort the market. Even libertarians agree with let the market work, let the market actually do its job. But you're not letting the market do its job if you're subsidizing. Now, people say the price of food would go up, and that's bad, and that's regressive against the poor. Garbage. Number one, diabetes is more regressive against the poor. And number two... Right. If you got rid of all food subsidies, and the UC, UC Berkeley uh, Giannini Foundation did this exercise several years ago, they modeled what would the price of food look like if you got rid of all food subsidies. And it turns out the price of food wouldn't change, except for two items, corn and sugar, which is exactly what we want to go up because we need to consume less of it. So to me... The answer is get rid of the subsidies. And then the food industry won't have the impetus to, be do the, to do the wrong thing. Then we can get them to do the right thing. So are there ways to make processed food healthier? And the answer is yes, there are. Okay. They involve changes in ingredients, in substitutions in some cases. You know, like, for instance, new sweeteners that are becoming available that we are starting to get data on and to determine whether or not they can contribute to metabolic health. Changes in packaging, changes in formulation, changes in data science. Um, I'm working on several of the changes in procurement. I'm working on several of these. I am the chief medical officer of four companies dedicated to changing the food system. I'm an advisor to several others in order to be able to actually have a food system that provides food that is metabolically healthy so that people can thrive and not spend all their money on doctors. I mean, I think from, from everything we talked through. you can pay the farmer or you can pay the doctor. Yep. Or, you can, pay, or yeah. you can pay I mean, the petition. There you go. What for the, as, as we kind of start to wrap up, what, I mean, again, as I'm listening to this, I'm like, yes, this makes a ton of sense, right? For a lot, a lot, a lot of different points that you've made have made sense. Um, and especially some of the limitations to even some of the diets and, 
for me, I think the big one's the calorie, you know, conversation in particular, like, even though it, it tells you, you know, even in your daily calorie, it says, you know, hey, you're, you have a sugar intake, you know, it's, it, people still look at the calories and, and that, that one is, I think, pretty eye opening. You know, as we, as we, as we kind of come to a closer, what do you tell like the average person? So the average person, can we talk about this idea of real foods? Um, in particular, and that kind of being the key here and, and how in your patients and these, how have you, cause I think this is where everyone, you know, it's like, how do you start? Like, like where are the big areas that, that can make right. a big impact? You know, like when you talk to people that are trying to make a change in their life and you know, change can be, as you said, hard, um, what are the, like, how do people typically start that? And to your point about keto, they, right. then they relapse, right? Like how do you, how do you see people who are successful kind of start down this, right. this new path? Sure. Every public health uh, effort that we've had in this country from, you know, from day one has required personal intervention and societal intervention, both. So like tobacco, like alcohol, personal intervention can call rehab, societal intervention can call laws. Rehab and laws, rehab and laws, you need both. For sugar, for processed food, we have nothing. Zilcho, nada, today. All right? Until we have personal intervention and societal intervention, we will not get anywhere. So that's my goal, is to help make that happen. Now, you can't have either without education. So education is the start. And that's what we're doing now, is we're educating. And we know that we're effective, and I can tell you in a minute why, right? But education softens the playing field and allows for societal intervention to be able to take hold for people to ultimately accept it. And you can see, look, drunk driving, you know, used to be you got off with a hand slap, okay? Now, you know, it's like zero tolerance, right? And you know, bartenders go to jail if they let people leave the bar, you know, drunk. All right. uh, click it and tick it, right? If, you know, if you leave your, if you pull out of your driveway, you know, and you haven't clicked your seatbelt, number one, your kids will scream at you. And number two, the cop will arrest <laughs> you. All right? Like, how did that happen? All right. And same with tobacco. You know, it used to be smoking was cool. Now it's a filthy habit. Had that happened, these cultural yeah. tectonic shifts over the past 30 years occurred because we educated the public, and especially we educated the children. And the children grew up and they voted. And the naysayers are dead. That's why this is a right. generational shift. Well, this is what's going on in food now. Okay, we're in the, we're in the midst of this 30-year cycle we're about, I would say, eight to nine years into it. So we have a long way to go. But people are starting to respond. And I know they're responding because the food industry actually assessed it for me. <laughs> Thank you. There is a uh, public relations arm of the food industry called IFIC, the International Food Information Council. Okay? They're the bad guys. <laughs> but... Okay. Yeah, I can imagine. I, just by the name, I'm like that. That looks great on like a mahogany, de like you know, office that you walk into in like DC, right. where Absolutely. It's <laughs> the a lobbying, lobbying is happening. PR, you know, arm yeah. of the food industry. All right. Well, they in 2011, they they do an annual survey. In 2011, they asked the public, simple question: What component of food is the most uh, obesogenic? What causes the most weight gain? And back then, only 11% of the public said refined carbohydrate or sugar. 42% said a calorie is a calorie or I don't know. They asked the same question seven years later, 2018. And now 33% of the public says refined carbohydrate or sugar. And an equally uh, smaller number of people, reciprocally smaller number of people, say a calorie is a calorie or I don't know. So the education is working. The education is working. And people are now starting to demand better because it's not just about calories. Now they understand the quality of the food is more important than the quantity. And so you are seeing a food revolution. Right. And you are seeing the uh, uh, consumers demand better. And you're seeing startups 
actually trying to disrupt the, 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 the model. So it's working. It's working. Um, it's going to take a while longer. You know, there's still some people who are sugar addicts who will never give up, you know, their, uh, their candy bars or their, you know, their sodas. But the bottom line is uh, it takes time. And, you know, I'm clear, I'm clear on that. You know, I don't expect it to change overnight. I've watched all of these other public health uh, e efforts, you know, and how long they took. You know, I'm old enough to see, have seen those. And I recognize I'm just a cog in a wheel. You know, it's, it, it's probably, this problem will probably outlive me, but I'm comfortable with that. You know, the point is it's going in the right direction. That's awesome. I mean, look, this has been interesting. I mean, for me in particular, like this is something where, you know, somebody especially who has two young kids, I've got a four and a seven year old. And, you know, you think about these things and you know, and then again, it's the, you know, again, it's the food industry makes the certain types of things the most convenient. Um, you know, I know as a parent, that can be a tough choice. And as like, we're talking through this, it's not, not difficult, but more of convenient choice. That's probably a better word than tough, um, convenient choice. And so, I know, and I, I'm sure my listeners too, I mean, for me, this ep episode has been fantastic and I've, I've got a ton of takeaways and I'm like Googling <laughs> some of this. I'm like, oh God, this is, yes, this is like, we've got to do this. You know, I can't wait for my wife to listen to. I know she'll, she'll, she'll definitely be all about it, but, but no, I really appreciate it, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure our listeners got a ton out of it as well pleasure, too. Jake. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, um, um, I was uh, very, you know, happy to sort of, you know, give you the, the the lay of the land uh, as it were it's uh it's it's an it's an interesting it. ride it really is and, and and again and i think you articulated a way for at least i think hopefully all of my listeners to where they can do something about it so really appreciate it again and, and thank you everyone else uh for tuning in today and we'll see you next week on the jake dunlap show all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too, of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.